Have you ever scrolled through online comments and um, seen someone claim they cured their HIV with herbal remedy? And it maybe made you wonder, you know, could there actually be something to it? Oh, absolutely. You're definitely not alone if you've seen those. They pop up quite a bit, don't they? They really do, especially like on YouTube or other social media. Yeah, it's interesting how persistent those claims are. They seem to tap into this real desire for well, simple answers, maybe. Exactly. And that's precisely what we're getting into today. Our mission really is to uh, dig into the truth behind these herbal HIV cure claims mm. and also to emphasize how crucial, reliable testing and you know established medical treatment really are. Right. So for this deep dive, we're looking at those online discussions, those videos where these claims surface, but also comparing it to what we actually know from, well, HIV science and testing. And it's so important we look closely at this because like we see online, when someone gets an HIV diagnosis, it's completely natural to search for hope, any sign of hope. Of course. But the internet, well, it can be a minefield, can't it? Full of information that isn't always reliable. And that unfortunately can have some pretty serious health consequences. Absolutely. So today we're planning to unpack a few key things for you. First, what do herbal remedies actually do? And maybe more importantly, what can they absolutely not do when we talk about HIV? Okay. Then we'll look at what the real science says about curing HIV. The actual evidence. Exactly. We also want to explore, you know, why some people might be promoting these herbal cures online. What's the motivation? That's a big question. Yeah. And we'll give you some pointers on how to spot and frankly avoid this kind of misinformation. And finally, really underline why getting tested early and starting proven medical treatments is just so vital. Sounds good. OK, so let's start there. When we say herbal medicine, what are we actually talking about? Things like turmeric, ginger. Yeah, exactly. At its core, herbal medicine uses plants or parts of plants for health purposes. You mentioned turmeric, ginger, mm. others you hear about are neem, moringa, black seed oil, lots of them. Right. And these have long histories in traditional use in various cultures, definitely. Yeah. And like you see discussed online, some do seem to offer general health benefits. Okay, general benefits. But let's get to the heart of it, the big question. Can these herbal medicines actually cure HIV? That really is the critical point, isn't it? Yeah. So while some herbs you might read about online could potentially offer some general immune system support. Like garlic, maybe, or moringa. Right, maybe things like garlic, moringa is quite nutrient rich. Ginger has anti-inflammatory properties, things like that. But, and this is crucial, supporting the immune system generally is fundamentally different from eliminating a specific virus like HIV. Ah, uh, okay, that's a really important distinction. It's not the same mechanism at all. One is general support, the other is targeting and destroying a specific pathogen. So what does the scientific community, the medical consensus, say about an HIV cure? Where do we stand now, say, in 2025? Well, the scientific consensus is crystal clear. Mm -hmm. As of now, 2025, there is no cure for HIV, period. No But, and this is a huge but, a massive achievement of modern medicine, we have antiretroviral therapy, or RT. Our Think of art as these highly effective medications that specifically stop the HIV virus from replicating, from making copies of itself in your body. Okay. This dramatically lowers the viral load. That's the amount of virus in the blood. Yeah. Often down to levels so low, they're called undetectable. Undetectable. And that's key, isn't it? It's absolutely key. Because when someone's viral load is undetectable, it becomes effectively impossible for them to transmit HIV to a partner sexually. It's called UAU. Undetectable equals untransmittable. Got it. So, no cure yet, but with RT, people living with HIV can live long, healthy lives, essentially normal lifespans. That's incredible progress. So, okay, when we contrast these herbal remedies pitched as cures online with art, what are the fundamental differences in terms of, like, proof? Evidence. Well, the difference in evidence is just stark. It's night and day, really. Okay. For most of these herbal remedies claimed online to cure HIV, there's a profound lack of rigorous scientific testing, meaning things like large-scale, randomized, controlled clinical trials. That's the gold standard for proving if a treatment actually works and is safe. Mm -hmm. These herbs generally don't have that for HIV. Okay. And RT. RT, on the other hand, has decades, literally decades, of extensive clinical data from millions of people worldwide. We know it works. Right. We know it reliably suppresses the virus, prevents disease progression, prevents transmission when undetectable, and allows for that normal lifespan. So while herbs might have some role in general wellness, 
for some. Uh, maybe for symptoms. Perhaps, yeah, or just general health. But they absolutely cannot replace RT for managing HIV. It's not even close. It seems so clear when you put it like that, which makes it even more concerning that people are still online promoting these herbal cures. Why? What are the likely reasons behind this? It's complex. Yeah. Connecting it to how health info spreads online. Mm. You see a few things happening. Mm. Um, sometimes you might have individuals, maybe self-proclaimed healers or traditional practitioners who genuinely believe in these herbs. Okay, genuine belief. Possibly. Even without the science. But then there's often a financial motivation, let's be honest. Ah, selling products. Exactly. The internet gives you this huge reach, right? So you can market these often very expensive herbal kits or concoctions to a wide, sometimes vulnerable audience. And what about just attention? Likes and shares? That too. Online popularity, yeah. yeah. Getting views, shares, engagement. That can be a powerful driver for making sensational claims, whether they're true or not. You build the following, maybe an income stream. And we've seen kind of how they do it, some specific tactics in their marketing. Oh, definitely. These often involve really emotional testimonials, personal stories of supposed miracle cures. These can be incredibly persuasive, especially to someone desperate for hope. Yeah, I can see that. And what's really tricky is that many people making these claims, mm. well, they don't have any recognizable medical qualifications or scientific credentials. They often operate outside the established health system. So it's hard to verify anything. Exactly. Yeah. Hard to verify, hard to hold accountable. And these claims get amplified because they tap into that very real, very human desire for a cure. Yeah. It makes people susceptible. So caution is really needed when you see this stuff online. It really is. It's easy to see the appeal of those stories though, but let's dig a bit deeper into why someone might choose to believe in an herbal cure, even when the science points elsewhere. What's going on psychologically or culturally? That's a really important layer. Several factors often come into play. Uh, one big one is the fear of stigma associated with HIV. Right. Still a major issue. Huge issue. People might hesitate to go to a regular clinic, worried about judgment, lack of privacy, what people might think. Okay, that makes sense. Then there's just sheer desperation, especially right after a diagnosis. You want to cure any cure now. Understandable. Cultural beliefs can also play a part. In some communities, there's a strong tradition or preference for natural remedies, sometimes seen as inherently safer or better than pharmaceuticals. And finally, there can be a deep mistrust of the conventional healthcare system. This might be especially true for marginalized groups who've maybe had negative experiences or feel the system doesn't serve them well. Right, so it's not always simple. Not at all. Understanding these reasons helps us approach the conversation with more you know, empathy and understanding. It's not just about dismissing beliefs, but understanding where they come from. That's a really good point. But understanding doesn't negate the risks. What are the actual dangers if someone with HIV relies on these unproven herbal cures instead of art? What could happen? The dangers are incredibly serious. Uh, the biggest one is delaying the start of effective RT. Okay. And while they delay? While they're taking herbs they saw online, the HIV virus isn't being suppressed. It's oh. continuing to replicate, continuing to damage their immune system. So it gets worse. It gets pro progressively worse. These cures can create this false sense of security, this false hope. They might feel okay for a while or think the herbs are working, but biologically, the virus is winning. The viral load goes up, the immune system weakens, and the risk of opportunistic infections and other HIV-related illnesses increases dramatically. And the risk of transmission. Also increases. Mm. Without RT suppressing the virus to undetectable levels, the person remains infectious and can transmit HIV to others. Wow. So ultimately, choosing unproven herbs over proven medicine isn't just ineffective, it can be life-threatening. It's trading science for anecdotes, and the stakes are just too high. That really drives home the importance of accurate information and crucially reliable testing. Mm. How does someone actually find out their HIV status for sure? What tests are trustworthy? Okay, yeah, testing is fundamental. The only way to know your HIV status definitively is through proper testing, usually lab-based. Right. There are a couple of main types used now. The HIV RNA test is very sensitive. It looks directly for the virus's genetic material. RNA, got it. How early can it detect? It can often detect HIV as early as 7 to 10 days after a potential exposure. So it's very useful for early detection. Okay, 7 to 10 days. What else? Then there's the fourth generation antigen antibody test. This one looks for both HIV antigens, parts of the virus itself, and antibodies, which your body makes in response to the virus. And that one? How soon? That one typically detects HIV around 2 to 4 weeks after exposure. 
It's also very reliable and commonly used. So getting tested with one of these is the way to go. Absolutely. <laughs> Using reliable, validated tests is crucial for an accurate diagnosis. And we want to make sure people know where they can get that reliable testing. For our listeners in the U.S. who might need quick, affordable, and confidential HIV testing, um, a great resource is HIVRNATestGuide.com. Okay. They have a really large network over 4,500 testing locations across the country offering these kinds of reliable lab tests. Getting tested really is that critical first step. Definitely. Knowledge is power here. So we've established there's no cure now, but RT is highly effective. What about the future? Is science working towards an actual cure? Yes, absolutely. The scientific community hasn't given up on finding a cure. There's a lot of exciting research happening. Yeah. Well, things like gene editing technologies, CRISPR is one you hear about. Mm. There are clinical trials exploring if that can be used to essentially cut HIV out of infected cells. Wow. Okay. That sounds futuristic. It is cutting edge stuff. There's also intense work on therapeutic vaccines, not preventative ones, but vaccines designed to help someone who already has HIV control the virus, maybe without needing daily art. Interesting. And there are various experimental therapies being tested. Things with names like EBT-101 or AGT-103T have shown some early promise in studies. Okay. But the key thing here is, this is all science-backed, evidence-based research. It's methodical, it's tested rigorously. Unlike the online rumors. Precisely. But it's also important to stress these are still in research and trial phases. They aren't available treatments yet. So for now, art remains the proven, effective standard of care. Got it. Research is ongoing, but art is the reality today. So let's circle back to herbs for a second. We know they can't cure HIV, but is there any potential benefit at all? Could they play a supportive role, maybe? Yeah, that's a fair question. It's possible herbs could have a place as a complementary approach, meaning alongside medical treatment, not instead of it. Complementary? How so? Well, perhaps for managing some side effects of medication, like using ginger tea for nausea, maybe, or just for general wellness, ensuring good nutrition with nutrient-rich plants, or using herbs known for stress relief, like ashwagandha or chamomile, perhaps. Okay, so symptom management or general well-being. Potentially, yes. Yeah. But and it's, but you have to keep saying they're not a cure. They mm -hmm. don't treat the underlying virus. Right. And critically, anyone living with HIV who is considering using any herbal product, even vitamins or supplements, must talk to their doctor first. Why is that so important? Because some herbs can interfere with how art medications work. They can interact, potentially making the RT less effective or increasing side effects. So. That conversation with a doctor is absolutely essential before mixing anything. Okay, vital point. Doctor consultation is key. This has been uh, really clarifying. So let's try to boil it down to the absolute must-remember takeaways for our listeners. Okay, I think the core messages are, first, HIV cannot be cured with herbs. That's just not scientifically possible right now. Right, no herbal cure. Second, HIV can be very effectively managed and controlled with modern medicine, specifically RT. People can live long, healthy lives. Good. Effective treatment exists. And third, early detection through proper, reliable lab testing is absolutely essential. It lets you start treatment promptly and protect your health. Test early. Treat early. Got it. Those are the fundamentals. And that really leads to a final kind of challenging question for everyone listening. Before you believe that anonymous YouTube comment, or before you click on some link promising a miracle cure, just pause and ask yourself, what's the potential cost if I'm wrong? That's a powerful question to sit with. What are the real stakes? Absolutely. And again, if you think you might have been exposed to HIV, please don't wait and wonder. You can visit HIVRNATestGuide.com for that quick, affordable, confidential testing across the U.S. Yeah, taking action is key. And maybe thinking a bit broader, you know, this whole issue highlights how easily misinformation can spread in healthcare. It really underlines the need for critical thinking whenever we see health claims online. That's true. It makes you wonder what other areas of health might be vulnerable to these kinds of false promises. And maybe how can each of us become a bit more discerning, more critical consumer of health information generally? Something to think about.